Welcome back. Today we're going to talk a little bit about treatment of some of the microbial diseases. I'm actually going to stay away from treatment of parasitic diseases and those others that we've mentioned because we've really talked about them. And now I'm going to focus on antibiotics and the treatment of bacterial diseases. We really live in, a, in an interesting time. We have a very interesting problem regarding antibiotics and infection. There is a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And I'm afraid we're living in very interesting times when it comes to antibiotics. Let me go back and tell you a little bit about the history of this, of how we treated bacterial infections in the pre-antibiotic era. Mercury was probably used as far back as the 1400s as a cure for syphilis. It was very toxic. They took elemental mercury, injected it into patients. It's a heavy metal. Uh, it stayed there as a depot injection. In other words, it stayed there for a long time with small quantities being released. And it did cure syphilis, but it made the patients very, very sick from the mercury itself. We know about this because you see the mercury in the tissues of bodies from that uh, period. And then the Chinese started doing something very clever about the same time. They used moldy soybean curds to treat infections of the skin. And this was probably penicillin. Penicillin is a mold. It's a fungus. And so they were probably uh, using the penicillin without knowing why uh, at that time, because again, they didn't know what bacteria were. And North American, Native Americans used moldy leather sandals, sandals that had gotten old and wet and also probably had developed some penicillin mold growing on them. And they used these to treat foot infections. So again, they had stumbled on something uh, very appropriate, although they probably at that point didn't know why. And then Native Americans here and in Europe around the 17th century chewed the bark of the chincona tree, which as I told you in the last lectures, um, contained quinine to cure malaria. And that's an extraordinary use of something. I mean, how do you pick out what tree to start chewing on uh, to know what's gonna cure malaria? And what's interesting is there is a superiority of almost all the naturally occurring medicines on our planet that occur in nature without us having to invent them over the medicines that we tend to make. And what I mean by that, when that medicine is appropriate, it's usually better than the synthetics. For example, when penicillin is appropriate for a particular bacteria, there's nothing better. And uh, we have the same with digitalis for heart disease. We've made artificial improvements, but those are for special circumstances. Uh, the belladonna alkaloids, they were named belladonna because they make the eyes dilate. So they make women look beautiful because their eyes are so black. And we still use the belladonna alkaloids almost unchanged in anesthesia. And finally, the granddaddy of them all is aspirin, one of the finest medicines ever to come about on Earth. We can now synthesize it, but we don't change its structure. When aspirin is good, it's the best. So the naturally occurring ones are where we should be looking for a lot of these drugs and cures for things that ail us. The beginnings of the antibiotic era, era probably started back in about 1908 in Germany with uh, the Bayer Company and IG Farben making sulfanilamide, which was used for dyes in the dye industry and found to be effective against um, microorganisms, but not used for another 20 years or so. And then in 1908, a man named Paul Ehrlich used the term the magic bullet, trying to find a drug that would be useful against syphilis. And what he wanted was something better than uh, mercury. And he was looking for the magic bullet, something that would just nail the syphilis organism, but not hurt the patient. And that term has been used ever since in looking for these cures. And then finally, in about 1928-29, Alexander Fleming was uh, working in his laboratory and he was using a dish that looked something like this, a Petri dish with an agar gel. Agar agar is a gel made from an African seaweed. This is a blood agar plate in which animal blood is added to help things grow. And bacteria grows on the surface of this agar dish. And he was working with Staph aureus, the one we've talked about, and doing research on influenza when he got a little sloppy. 
just like some of the other scientists we talk about, and allowed his dish to be contaminated uh, with a mold. And what he found, very similar to this, this is not the case, but you see those clear circles in the middle of the bacteria are areas where they are bacteria free. And he experimented a little more and he saw that there was something in the mold culture that inhibited the growth of the Staph aureus and he named it penicillin. He named it that because the mold he determined was called Penicillium notatum. And so he, he named that, and that was the first, at least the first, uh, uh, that man noticed that this naturally occurring substance could have an effect, and he called it antibiosis, meaning against the growth of life, and he meant something in nature that could stop the growth of living organisms. Um, other people actually in France claim to have discovered this before, but they never published and they were never credited with it. And it was a funny thing, Fleming never followed up on this, on use in human disease. I, I actually, in 1959, when I was in college, I was able to have lunch with Lady Alexander Fleming, who was his widow at the time, and I was just dying to ask her, why didn't he do something with this? Because it was an obvious place to go, but he never did. He died without ever following this path again. Then in the 1930s, um, the first sulfur drugs that came out of the dye industry were used against bacteria. And if you remember in World War II, the GIs and the medics always had little paper pack packets of sulfur powder they would tear open and sprinkle in virtually every wound. And that had some effect on su at least suppressing the level of bacteria in war wounds. And then early in war World War II, well, we started using actual penicillin on our side, and it was so precious and so difficult to, uh, to obtain that we had to reuse it. And the soldiers were given uh, actually only thousands of units because the bugs were all susceptible. They hadn't been exposed. They had never gotten any resistance, and we didn't have very much of it. And what we did was any of the soldiers who got this had their urine collected. Penicillin is excreted in the urine, and then it was re-purified out of the urine and used again on the next GIs very effectively, a very important uh, reducer of mortality in the battlefield. This was a lot of the pioneering work of a man named Flory and an associate named Chain, and they actually won the 1945 Nobel Prize along with uh, Fleming for the discoveries of the uses of penicillin. And today, so we use antibiotic at, and have expanded it to mean anything we use against bacterial infectious, infections. And um, although the original term really meant something that originated from nature that we used against them. Let's look at some of the antibiotics that are naturally occurring. If I can get this slide up. Um, and their mechanisms of action. These are the sources of some really great drugs, and they all occurred in nature. Penicillin here is at the top. It's effective almost, almost um, solely against gram-positive bacteria, and it works on the synthesis of the wall. And it's many of the penicillin species that are the source. Then came the development of a drug called bacitracin, again for gram-positive uh, bacteria, and it was effective against wall synthesis. So what was happening was that these cells had to be dividing in order for them to be killed. What would happen is the bacterium would begin to build a new wall during division, try to divide, but the wall would be defective and the bacteria would die. It would literally spill out its guts and wouldn't be able to finish the completion of that wall. So quiescent or dormant bacteria could survive a dose of antibiotics from something like penicillin. Um, there was a chemical interaction which caused something called cytolysis in almost all of these that I'm showing you at the top. Um, if you look at the next one, the cephalosporin groups, you've heard of such drugs as Keflex and Sofoxetin. They're in common use today. They're much broader in spectrum. So where penicillin was missing some bacteria, especially in mist effect infections, we use the cephalosporins, and they too inhibit wall synthesis, and they too come from a natural spores. 
mo a source. Most of these are fungi. The polymixin group is a more toxic group. We use them often topically rather than systemically in patients. And these are effective in gram-negative bacteria and the cell membrane is slightly different in those and that's what's attacked. Uh, you remember if we look at this slide that the gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria have very, very different structure on their cell coverings so that it's uh, uh, the obvious reason why we need different drugs to work against them. Neomycin is something used very frequently topically in both solution and salves, comes from streptomyces, uh, and you can see, look at all the different streptomyces variations that give us erythromycin for gram-positive, neomycin much broader, streptomycin, very, very important gram-negative bacteria, and used to be used against tuberculosis for a long time. It can cause nerve deafness in patients in, in high doses for long periods, so it has that limitation. And the tetracycline group comes from, again, the streptomyces, very broad spectrum, used widely uh, for many, many kinds of infections, and it's a very safe drug to use, except that it sensitizes the skin to um, ultraviolet rays of the sun. And then griseofulvin comes from, again, another variation of penicillin, and it affects microtubules in the fungi, in the skin, these micro, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the structure of the fungi, it decreases their production of microtubules, which is a support structure. So this is used solely against fungal diseases. Penicillin looks like this. Everywhere there's a juncture here, there's a carbon atom, so it's a, an organic atom, a carbon-based structure. And this is called the beta-lactam moiety. This is where the action is. This is where the, um, the power of penicillin lies. This is hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and these are put in for radicals. All variations of other chemicals we represent as a radical. Now, what the way this works is that the this beta lactam is the part of the structure that allows the breakdown of these walls. Unfortunately, the bacteria in their natural selection have produced an enzyme called beta lactamase. And you know by now that that means they're going to break down beta lactam and spontaneous mutations with natural selection purely by chance on billions and billions of bacteria have caused some strains of bacteria to become penicillin resistant. They also can develop their own resistance within the cell wall itself without even the beta lactamase, so those bugs also become resistant. And what happens is that natural selection speeds up the development of resistance, especially when the drug, or any drug, is, is used outside the guidelines or inappropriately. The most egregious use probably is the widespread use of antibiotics against viral illnesses. People catch a cold or the flu, they feel sick, they've got fever, headache, muscle aches and pains, they go to bed, and if they have leftover antibiotics, they will often take them. Antibiotics are totally, totally useless against viruses, and worse is you're now exposing the normal flora of the body to antibiotics, which one, can upset them and cause overgrowth, and number two, cause resistance in case you ever need it, and three, can develop allergies in the patient who's now having penicillin and may not have had it before. So it's a really, really bad idea to use antibiotics inappropriately. Also, another use is stopping the course of treatment as soon as the symptoms abate. When the patient feels better, there's a real tendency for them uh, to stop taking the drug or just to forget to take it. We talked about this in strep throat, how if you have a strep pharyngitis, penicillin is so effective that the symptoms go away within a couple of days and you're sitting there with a 10-day bottle of uh, penicillin that you decide not to take. This can cause rheumatic fever, 
uh, arthritis, rheumatic heart disease, but it also can get into the development of resistance in either the strep, which is unusual, or other bacteria. The toxicity is extremely low. Penicillin is really a non-toxic medication. It's really quite interesting. You can almost not poison anybody with penicillin. Uh, you can poison patients with almost anything else, including water. You give somebody enough water, they'll dilute and die. But penicillin is so non-toxic that in order to poison somebody, you have to give them enough so that one of the salts in the penicillin is what actually hurts them. It's usually combined with a potassium salt. It's actually the potassium that does the damage, not the penicillin, unless you're allergic. And if you're allergic, then it only takes one molecule. It doesn't matter how much you give the patient. Lowering the dose won't help. And there are crossover allergies with penicillin and other penicillin-like drugs. So this is a real problem if a patient has had any kind of reaction to penicillin, like a rash or some wheezing. Anything that would suggest allergy, you probably should not give the patient penicillin or a penicillin derivative. If you really, really need to give them that drug, if this is life-threatening and you need penicillin in the mix, what we usually do is either skin test them to make sure, a very minute dose just under the skin, hope for the best, or you can combine it with anti-immune therapy as well to try to hold back the allergic reaction. That's really very rare. We have many, many other drugs we can use today, so that's not usually a problem. Now, penicillin has a lot of variants. Since the early days of penicillin G, which was one of the first ones, that was the gold standard. It was called benzyl penicillin, and it was the gold standard against which all the other forms were judged. If they were as good as this or less toxic, we would move to that other form. The problem is it was only given intravenously because it's unstable in hydrochloric acid, so we can't give it by mouth. And high tissue doses could be achieved intravenously, so it was very, very useful. We gave this for serious life-threatening infections, for, for example, a bacterial endocarditis, growth in the heart, septicemia, which we've talked about, bacterial meningitis, and so forth. And then came benzathine penicillin, which we don't use very much now, and it had a very, very slow release over a period of two to four weeks after intramuscular injection. This was called depo uh, penicillin, and it was given in cases where uh, you really needed to have the patient on the drug for a long time, and you had problems either of the patient getting back to you or patient compliance. There are patients who were just not very good at following uh, their instructions, so the advantage here was instant compliance. We had penicillin patients, uh, sorry, syphilis patients on this for long periods of time. However, there's a big drawback. Once the drug is in, it's in, and it's there to stay for weeks and weeks. And if you have a bad reaction to it, then you have no way of getting this drug out of the patient. After that, we went to something called penicillin V or phenoxymethyl penicillin. This was the oral form, the first one you can take by mouth. We use it still for less severe infections and ones that tend to be very, very sensitive um, to this drug, streptococcal infections, tonsillitis, skin infections. Uh, cellulitis, which are infections of soft tissues that aren't too severe. And then came along another one called Augmentin, which was a combination of something called amoxicillin, another offshoot, and something called a beta-lactam um, with cla clavulinic acid. It's a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So going back to this slide, if you had uh, bugs that had beta-lactamase in it, it could break it down. The clavulinic acid was a beta-lactamase inhibitor, and you resulted, uh, this resulted in an antibiotic with a much bigger spectrum because it got around some of the resistance. And then there were the offshoots, and uh, ampicillin was one. It was a broad spectrum. 
included a lot of the gram-negative infections. The amoxicillin just had an easier dosage schedule. You could only give it, you only had to give it twice a day instead of four times, so you had better compliance. And then we had to get into the beta-lactamase resistant uh, organisms that were really getting significant. And we developed drugs called methicillin, flucloxacillin, and dicloxacillin. And these drugs got around uh, the enzyme resistance of the staph, but you never really win those battles because staphylococci, like any bacteria, will mutate and they'll continue to develop resistance. So in England, around the period of uh, 1961, and here's what I was talking about, life getting interesting, like a Chinese curse, they started reporting a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. This was called MRSA, or MRSA. And this is what we call a neatrogenic or a nosocomial infection. These are infections that occur in the place of care, like hospitals or doctor's offices. Aatrogenic te technically means anything the doctor causes when he does something to the patient. Nosocomial really refers to the infections. It started appearing in hospitals. It was a very serious problem because staph, when it gets inside, unlike, let's say, a boil or, or impetigo on the skin, gets very serious. As you saw in our pictures um, on bacterial infections, it can get to the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, really can become quite serious. And then we started to see it in gymnasiums where people were exchanging sweat inadvertently and skin organisms, tattoo parlors, and it is basically now in the public domain. MRSA infections are very serious. It's out in the real world, and it's also in hospitals, a very significant um, cause of mortality in the hospital. And there are carrier states. We used to have patients who carried it either on their skin or in their nose, and when they were medical personnel, we would culture them, and then we would put them on a course of antibiotics and they would get better and could come back to work so they weren't infecting patients. Now the problem is that we've got MRSA in a carrier state. We have health care givers, let's say surgeons, um, who have this in their nose or on their skin and we can't treat them. Now we're talking about legislation to require all medical care personnel to get cultures, and you're also talking at the same time of basically ending someone's career. Because if they are in the carrier state, you can't cure them, they really can't be exposed to patients. So we are entering now a new pre-antibiotic era when it comes to penicillin. We have developed a drug of last resort called vancomycin, Vanco, I think, comes from conquest or conquering. It's a very complex molecule, much more so than uh, penicillin. It's very good for gram-positive organisms. It is more toxic than penicillin uh, by a lot more. And there is resistance developing to vancomycin right now. So the problem is that antibiotic development is extremely long process. And there's high cost and the rapid development of resistance of the bacteria. And years and years, probably somewhere with clinical trials for safety of maybe five to seven to 10 years to develop a new antibiotic and hundreds of millions of dollars. And then we're shortening the time when resistance develops. So we've got a real problem. I want to show you a little bit on the practical side about what we do uh, and how we find out how to treat patients. For example, culture and sensitivities. I told you that we have uh, the problem with viruses and other organisms is they're not easier, easy enough to culture, so we can't practically develop techniques to get a quick diagnosis other than antibodies and clinical symptoms. It's totally different in bacterial diseases. First of all, we have the gram stain, which you now know about. You take a smear of the whatever substance you have, you put it on a slide, you stain it, decolorize it, stain it, and you have a gram stain. And immediately we know, is this gram positive or gram negative? We may not know what the bug is yet, but within 20 minutes of trying, we have gram positive cox uh, cox ion rods, gram negative cox ion rods, 
and from where we take the specimen, we can get a pretty good idea. If you get gram-negative diplococci off a urethral smear with somebody who has a penile discharge, you know, you're dealing with gonorrhea. If you get gram-positive cocci in clusters out of somebody's boil, you're probably dealing with staphylococci anyway, and you'll know where to begin antibiotics. The same thing is true of the culture. At the same time you take the smear, you then go and swab them on an auger plate, as shown here. You can actually see the lines of swabbing that they did in this one, and places where they touched it. And then they put this in an incubator, and this will take two or three days. And we also put them on different kinds of mediums, or media. We put them on blood auger, and then we have chocolate auger, which isn't really chocolate, but it's brown, and different kinds that inhibit the growth of some bacteria, stimulate the other, and we end up for one patient with a stack of auger dishes, lay them out, and we can usually tell within two or three days what we're dealing with. Very, very good way to, um, to do this. And, but we have to start our treatment first. So we usually will get the culture and the smear, make an estimation, start treatment, and then wait for the culture to come back. Then we do antibiotic sensitivities. Now here is a plate that is growing a bacterium and the, normally this plate without these little discs would have completely covered the slide much as the other one was doing. And what we've done here is we've placed little discs, they're papers, and you can see they have letters written on them and they're various antibiotic impregnated paper discs with the dose and the antibiotic written on the disc, and then the bacteria start to grow. We, these are on the disc before we actually swab it. The bacteria grow for a few days in an incubator, and in some, the bacteria grow right over the disc. So if this is uh, some particular antibiotic, we know it doesn't have any effect. Here, there's a little bit of suppression, and look at this, here there's a lot. And we actually measure the amount, which looks like complete suppression here, and the distance. We can tell how much of the antibiotic diffuses out into the gel to keep, this one looks absolutely perfect, nothing is getting near this disc. So we can pick this up, see what the dose is, and tell what antibiotic is best for the patient. This is called culture and sensitivity. Now, we do have selective toxicity in all these uh, antimicrobials, and we need to kill the bacteria while sparing normal tissue. And we look for targets that are very, very specific in some of the different bacteria. We have also something called a therapeutic index. And this is the ratio of the dose of the drug that will get the patient sick and eventually die, so we look for the lethal dose, versus the amount of the um, microbial, antimicrobial in this case, or medication of any kind that is needed to cure the patient. So we're looking at lethal dose and the ratio to the therapeutic dose. It's called the therapeutic index. We want a high therapeutic dose. For example, if it takes 100 milligrams of morphine to kill you and 10 to get rid of the pain, that's a therapeutic index of 10. That's very good. We don't want a therapeutic index of 1.5, where our doses are going to get so close that variations in the patient are going to make the difference between life and death. Problem these days is we're using antibiotics in animal feeds. So you may think you've never had penicillin and you're not allergic, but you actually had when you ate that chicken the other night that had antibiotic in it to protect them from overcrowding. Um, again, this is a problem that's becoming worse and worse. Started a long time ago. Here's a public service announcement on a uh, trash can in last war telling people they need to buy bonds and they need to get penicillin to cure their gonorrhea. See your doctor today. This is when it all started, World War II, and now we may be back to that time again in the pre-antibiotic era. This brings us to the end of our talk about the treatment of bacterial diseases, and next time I'd like to go ahead and look at some of the really great moments in the discoveries of some of these cures.